So do you have a favorite book of the Bible? What's your favorite book of God's Word? Big John. Big John? <laughs> the Gospel of John. Yes, that's a good book. When uh, we started out going through the, the New Testament Sunday School, we, we went right for John. You know, there's, uh, there's some very good and precious promises to the church in there. And he's revealed. I mean, Jesus is revealed so powerfully through the Gospel of John. Anybody else? Um, no? So far, that's all, all of Paul's letters. All of Paul's letters. <laughs> There's some pretty good ones there. Anybody have a least favorite book? Leviticus. Leviticus. <laughs> Why? All those laws. The laws. Yeah. I, I have a rough time with, uh, you know, the Chronicles because of all the names. Yeah. You know, uh, we go through those and, boy, we, we, we tried pronouncing all the names. And after a while, it's just like, yeah, that name right there. You know, th this whole group of names. Well, you can read them at your leisure. <laughs> you it made know. me cry as a young girl. Yeah. Those. The Bagots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are struggling. But, you know, it, it, God put them in there for a reason. And, and, and it's to, he knows exactly who are his and, the, you know, where we've come <laughs> from. And, you know, there's a purpose. But, you know, again, why, you know, <laughs> as you're reading through them sometimes. That's one of the blessings of Oh, yeah. Yeah, let, letting the guy on the Bible app read those names for you. It's like, oh, that's how you pronounce that. I would have never guessed. <laughs> and even he gets it wrong, I can guarantee, because that's Hebrew. Hebrew. You know, we, can, we don't have the <laughs> and all the, the, the different sounds that they make. So, yeah. you know, um, it's interesting uh, uh, through history, uh, there was one book that has really impacted the church greatly. Uh, Christostom, I, I think I butchered his name. It was an early church father. He had the book of Romans read to him twice a week. As he was going about his business, he had somebody there constantly reading the book of Romans to him. Uh, you know, Martin Luther, the, the great reformation, it, 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 he credits the book of Romans for that start uh, of, of the early church, that, as we know it, uh, the Protestant movement. So, you know, I, I was trying to figure out where I was going next because we've been spending some time, we, we spent some time in uh, the, uh, the, the little book of Philippians and, and it's been laid upon my heart to, to jump into Romans since it was so important to the early church fathers and it's affected the church so much. I figured let's, let's jump in and see what it says. So if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Starting out on verse 1, and like you said, it's one of Paul's writings. It's, they're all good. You know, it, it's hard really to pick which one's my favorite, you know, or which one's my least favorite. I know when we went into our Wednesday night study, we jumped right into Isaiah. And uh, let's see, let's just say our teacher was a little apprehensive because jumping right into prophecy, uh, it was a little challenging, wasn't it? But we were blessed for it. Yeah, just a little bit. Then we, we went right into Jeremiah after that one, so we figured we'd ease up on him a little. Yeah. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, starting out verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his namesake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also, are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. This, this book starts out with Paul declaring basically that, you know, you know he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And, and we think highly of the apostles, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they are the ones that have, have revealed to us God's plan. 
you know, and, and they had great authority. They, they went around, they had the authority that God gave them to go around and doing great miracles to, to, to show the world that, uh, that they were the servants of God. But notice he says that he was a servant uh, of Christ Jesus. That word there is doulos. It, it was a bond servant. It, it was the lowest form of servant known. And it was almost an insult. In fact, it's, in the early days, it was considered an insult to call somebody a, 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 a doulos. And that's how Paul thinks of himself when he's, when he's saying that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. He, he's nothing special. He, he's taken a very humble opinion of himself, even though he has the authority of being an apostle. And he's called and he's set apart for the gospel of God. You know, and, and really, if you, if you really dive into the, the prophets and the Old Testament, it was always pointing to something more than the law. It, it was pointing towards Christ and him being the perfect sacrifice, that sacrifice which actually atoned for our sins. And, and, and as we read through the New Testament, you, you know, periodically, you need to jump back into the Old Testament and see how the two really uh, complement each other. We just, you know, when we were in Sunday school talking about the, the, the disciples on the Sea of Galilee in the storm, and then you go back to Psalm 107, and that story is told there in the Psalms mm -hmm. uh, of how God was going to calm the storm. You know, so you really, the best commentary you can ever read on the Bible is the Bible. It says, regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, to fulfill what God had promised David, that he would always have somebody on the throne. You know, he, he, he's fully man, isn't he? That way, as he, he experienced life, he experienced just like you and I have to experience it. He is fully man, but yet he is fully God. And it was declared by him being raised from the dead. You know, God gave him the authority to lay down his life. And he also gave him to take it up again. In him is life. Mm -hmm. By his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, Paul says, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles, to the obedience that comes from faith. And verse 6 says, And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You have a calling upon your life. Everybody has a calling. Who did Jesus pay for on the cross? Us, Us everyone. He died for the sins of the entire world. Now he's calling out to the world to come to him. And like I said, in the Old Testament, we have this story presented there before the New Testament was ever written. If you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, we'll start out at verse 22. Verse 22 says, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exult. God, from the beginning, has had a plan to save the entire world. Here he says, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. This was the Old Testament. This was back when the Jews thought that they were the only ones that were going to be in God's kingdom. They were the only ones going to be saved. They thought the Gentiles were nothing or were good for only the, being uh, fuel for the fires of hell. 
And that was never God's plan. He wanted the nation to be, the nation of Israel to be priests and, 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 and you know, and, and be the, the ones that would guide the rest of the world to God. But here God is pleading with the world. He says, turn to me and be saved. That's what he's calling out. That's the calling that he places upon each and every one of us. Come to me and be saved. That's how Paul is starting out. He's saying basically, he's saying, he's, there's a call that goes out. And he says, to all of you to belong to Christ Jesus. And, and the idea there, you know, again, is to be servants or to be slaves, but it's not in a negative context. To serve our Lord and Savior who's redeemed us from being a slave to sin. He's saving us from death. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. See, the, the, the problem is, is with the world's religion, they say all paths lead to heaven. No. There's only one, and his name is Jesus. And that's what's being declared here in Isaiah. And he says, basically, there's going to be two paths here. He says... But every knee will bow and every, uh, and every tongue will swear for uh, they will say of me in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. It's only in God that righteousness is found and power, strength, that idea of you know, being able to save anything. It's only found in God. All those who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. Have you ever seen or known anybody that has raged against God? When I get to heaven, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> I've heard people say that. <clears throat> or they have a very arrogant opinion of what hell's going to be like. We're just going to have a big old barbecue down there. I'll be there with my friends. Or we're just going to have a party. It says here that they will be put to shame. It's only in God that righteousness, that idea of being in right standing with God. And he's proclaiming this in the Old Testament. He says, just come to me. Turn to me and be saved. But in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exult. See, it's, there's a promise there for us as, as believers. See, we've been engrafted into that tree, into that olive branch. Mm -hmm. you know, and now this is a promise for us too. And it's, but in the Lord, notice it's in the Lord. In, both, in this passage, it's talking about being in him. See, the problem is, is the world right now thinks that in their religion, they'll make it to heaven. Mm -hmm. That that's worth something. I've read the book, and there is no religion that gets you to heaven. There's a relationship that gets you there, and his name is Jesus. He's the one that saves. The interesting thing about religion, and religion is supposed to be our response back to God because of what he has done for us, not how we get to him. But there in verse 25, it says, But in the Lord all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exult. Where are you at? Who do you belong to? It's interesting. Uh, we had a, a, a lady here in the church many years ago, and she declared herself to be an I.I. That stands for an independent individual. She didn't need anybody. At first, she didn't even need God. It's amazing how God can work on a person like that, especially when you're praying for him. And in the end, she turned out to be a sweetheart. Yeah. At first, she wasn't so much of a sweetheart. She was more like a polecat. <laughs> God has a way of doing that, but it was only in God. Yeah. Once she got into that relationship and she drew near to God, that he was able to change her. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what's going to change people. The people that you know, the people that you're praying for, it's God that's going to change them. It's being in the Lord. That's when they'll be declared righteous. Not in their abilities. And what they've done. If you would turn back with me to Romans now. Back in chapter 1. Verse 6 again. Let's re-look at that. It says, And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. See, you heard that call to come to him and to be saved. Saved from sin and death. Mm -hmm. That calling, the word there is kletos. Called, invited, summons to God, to salvation. So, did you hear that call? And have you responded? Verse 7 says, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Actually, that word to, to be has been added. It, it should read, it's just loved by God and called saints. Do you realize you're Saint Karina? And Saint Jeff? I get a new name on the other side. Yeah, we get a new name up there, but here he declares us to be saints. Yeah, it's not like we're a little thing that sits on the dash with the bobbly heads or stuff like that. He's the one that has declared this. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You want peace from God? You've got to experience the grace of God first. And that's what Paul reveals in every one of his letters. He says grace and peace. you first got to experience God's grace to understand what true peace is. You'll never find it in this world. Grace and peace to you. Verse 8 says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. See, the church at Rome had been established, but had never been visited by any of the apostles. Even though it's kind of credited to Paul that he may have been the founding father of this church, he'd never met them. Yet, he says, you're always in my prayers. And he thanks God for them. And, and their faith is being reported for, uh, uh, for uh, or all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is that something that we could say about the Church of Moore? Mm -hmm. That our faith is being reported all over this valley. That we still come together, even in the middle of a pandemic. That, that we preach God's word and, and that we, we glorify Jesus Christ. You know, and he goes on and he says, he prays for them. I ask you, do you pray for each other? Pray for me, I hope so, mm -hmm. I need it. You know, that, that, that's one thing that we can do is pray for each other. Lift each other up. And that's what Paul's doing here. Even to a church he'd never met. He was praying for them and thanking God for them. Verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we do sometimes when we come together, is we encourage each other. We, we, we encourage you to keep on running the race that's laid out before you. You know, we come together to worship God, but it's also that we talk about fellowship, but it's that fellowship of like-minded believers that just says, keep on keeping on. Keep on doing what God has called you to do, that calling that we just looked at. He's called you to belong to him. Mm -hmm. And as his servants, what do we do? Whatever he's called you to do is what you do. But he says, I long to see you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. We lift each other up. 
Just about the time we think we've blown it, somebody comes along with an encouraging word from God in his word that says, no, keep on keeping on. Please. That's what the church needs to be about, loving each other, lifting each other up. There's so many churches out there that, I mean, they're full of, uh, of gossip and, and, and tearing each other down. The world does that fine without our help. When we come together, it's lift each other up and encourage each other. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greek and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. The power of God. What is the power of God? It's the gospel, isn't it? For us... He says both the, the Greek and non-Greeks and, 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 and for the wise and the foolish. You know, it's, you know, it's to everybody. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ and it's the power of God to save a sinner like me who is condemned to death. What can God's power do? Save. Can save Save utterly, forever. Yeah, give us eternal life. You know, as we study God's word, there are so many examples of, uh, of what his power can do. I got one example. If you would, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, starting out of verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. Dry bones. Have you ever seen anything deader than dry bones? <laughs> You know, it's funny, every now and then the dog will dig up something from the yard, an old dry bone, and that's just what it is. There's no life in it. There's no nourishment from it. They, they carry it around for a while, but they don't even try and chew on it because it's just so hard and brittle. You know, a fresh bone, on the other hand, they'll go, they'll go crazy over because, you know, the marrow that's in there, the, the evidence of life is still there. But here he says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, Notice, hear the word of the Lord. What can the word of the Lord do? It can bring life to dry bones, mm -hmm. to the dead. See, when you and I heard the gospel, those were the words that were spoken to us, that we can come to life again. We were dead spiritually in our sins and our trespasses against God. And God gave us this promise. He says, you know, that we had to be born from above is really what the term is there in John chapter 3. You must be born again. When we claim to be a born again Christian, it really means we've got two birthdays, right? I have my physical birthday, but I have a spiritual birthday too. That day when God spoke to me and the dry bones came to life. And he continues on from there. He says, I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am 
the Lord. See, I, I look around and I think everybody here can honestly, and I, I feel comfortable saying, you know that he is Lord, right? You've heard God speak that to you, and you know without a shadow of doubt that he is God. As we've seen back in, in Isaiah chapter 45, that he is God and God alone. There is no other God. And he is the one that has spoken life into us, brought us to life spiritually. So Ezekiel continues on, he says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendon and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. And I said to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he has commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. God, in the power of his word, has breathed life back into us. We were dead, and we've come to life. And the analogy here is, is, is that there was this vast army. Well, we're a part of that. And I remember as a kid singing about being in the Lord's uh, army, you know, yeah. you know, was talking about I may never shoot the artillery and, and march in the infantry, you know, but all these things, you know, we're a part of that. You know, we're, we're to take up the shield of faith. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the full tune. I said it now, I forgot the full tune. I see some heads out there nodding, so you know it. <laughs> but the power of God's word. He is the one that has proclaimed this. Do you believe him? See, that, that's the problem is, is a lot of people have heard God's word, but they don't believe. And, and belief, you know, we're commended for faith in believing God. That's what faith is, is believing God in what he says and the power of his word. What has God's power done in your life? Has he brought you back to life? And, but being alive just isn't enough. I mean, here it talks about skin appeared and, and the bones were knit back together with tendons and there was muscles and, and, and a useful body was created and, and a body that was a part of the army. Just talking, you know, looking at what Jeff was saying here, right, as he was giving a, uh, you know, a testimony to what God is doing in his life. Basically, that's what we're called to be a part of. You know, the stirring, you know, these bones were stirred back to life. Are we being stirred back to life? And it's not by our own will. It's by God's word and the power of his word. It's where we, we are to get our life from. Turning back to Romans now, one more verse in Romans, and then we have one more passage to go to. Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says, For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. See, you've been declared righteous by God if you have faith in him and believe in his word and, and believe in what the, the Son of God did for us on the cross that 2,000 years ago. I mean, Abraham believed God when he told him that he was going to have the descendants, you know, that he, his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, and it was credited to him as righteousness. When we believe God and what he has promised through his Son, we are declared righteous. Do you all know what that word righteous means? Right standing with God. Righteousness, approved by God, just in the eyes of God. You're just, without sin. Declared not guilty. So what, what do we do? Like I said, we have one more passage. Turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 12. This is our last passage. 
Isaiah chapter 12. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's only six verses, so it won't take long. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1. It says, In that day you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were very angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Anybody in here ever had God mad at you? God, when we were in our sinful state, the, the wrath of God still remained upon us because of our sins. But when we invited Jesus into our hearts, we were forgiven. So his anger, he, he, he was angry with us, but his anger has been turned away and you have comforted me. Has God comforted you with his word, the power of his word? We've been declared righteous. We have been justified, sanctified. The atonement for our sins has been made. I don't know about you, but those are comforting words from God. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Right now in the world that we live in, the enemy is trying his darndest to make us afraid. You know, and it's just not right now either. It seems like every few years there's something out there to be afraid of. You know, I remember when, uh, you know, we had the Zika come out, and we've had the West Nile virus, and we've had all those other things. I remember there was a planetary alignment back in, I think it was 1985, that was supposed to rip the world apart. <laughs> 2000, you know, Y2K, remember that? Always something to be afraid of, to be fearful for. But here it says, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. We were talking about that in Sunday school. You know, that some plant and others go out in water. Where do we get our water from? From the wells of salvation. That endless supply, the, 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 uh, the unending source that Jesus Christ promises us of that living water. Verse 4, in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Do we have something to shout about? Mm -hmm. Something to proclaim? He has become our salvation. In him, we've, we've been declared righteous. Yeah, we have something to sing about, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know, we've been called to, be, be, to become, you know, uh, to belong to Jesus Christ, but it's not to, to do menial things. We've, we've been bought at a price to go out and declare the glories of God in the gospel. Mm -hmm. And that that is available for a lost and dying world, too that he paid their sin debt in full, that, that, that they too can be saved. He's calling to them. He's called to us, and we've answered the call, so what are we going to do about it? Well, there's a good template right here. You know, we can give thanks to the Lord and call on his name, <coughs> make known among the nations what he has done. See, that's called our testimony. Each and every one of us has a testimony, and it's not some rehearsed thing. It's what has God done for you in your life. Amen. You know, I never thought I had a testimony until I seen God's fingerprints on my life and what he did for me and how far back he had to go to get me. Now I have something to exalt God about, how he saved me. How did he save you? How did he rescue you? What did he call you out of? What did he, to, did, what sin has he forgiven you of? 
Yeah, I don't need a, a list. That's your testimony. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. You know, that's why we come to, even though we don't have a pianist, we still sing. Mm -hmm. Why? To praise God and to glorify his name. We sing about the blood. And I know there's some people when they come in, you guys are a gory bunch. You're always singing about the blood. That's right. <laughs> it's the blood that covers my sins and paid my debt in full. It's the blood that took the wrath of God and, and that was poured about upon Jesus and I no longer have to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel mm -hmm. among us. Paul, you know, even in the first 17 verses of Romans has said some very powerful things. I would, I would challenge you, go back and reread this and say, is this me? Does this apply to me? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Righteousness. He, he's placed a calling upon you. You know, what are we doing with that? What's the power of, of God's word to you? What, what, what is he enabling you to do or what is he calling you to do? Because I can guarantee you, if he's calling you to do it, he will enable you to do it. I could give you testimony about that for me being even standing up here, but we won't get into that tonight. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. We have something to praise God about. He saved us. We're His. And we're about glorifying God and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'll never get tired of singing about Him. You know, for some people, they well, you guys need to be more contemporary and stuff. Well, no, I, I need to be more about Jesus. You know, some of these contemporary songs are good. Some of them are not so good because they're kind of all about me and I and the things I can do. You know, it's all about him and what he's already done. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you. We're going to be in the book of Romans. Read ahead. You know, enjoy what God is going to tell us through this book. So for some people, they're intimidated by this book. Well, I find a book that maybe, maybe uh, has inspired, you know, so many, uh, uh, I won't say revolutions, but I mean, it, it caused people to, to come to the truth of God's word. Revivals were sparked because people started understanding the book of Romans. I would challenge you, dive in and, and let God, the power of God's word, speak to you as we journey through this book. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jeff? I just want to see how you get through it and stay politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let God do that, okay? <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time that we can spend in your presence, Lord. I thank you for the encouragement that we have from your word, both the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, Lord, for the, the Old Covenant in there was hidden the things of, of your heart, Lord, your desires to save all the world. Lord, to, to, to preach the, the good news to us Gentiles and to bring us in to your, to your nation, Lord, and to your people. Lord, help us to go forth and to preach the good news of this word, Lord, the power of your word, and that each and every person that we run into has been called of God, Lord, to, to enter into this relationship with Jesus, your son. Lord, I, I just ask for, for your guidance in each and every one of our lives, Lord. Give us the, 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 the understanding, but the, the ability to do what you've called us to do, Lord, just like Paul. Lord, to, to, to answer that call to be your people. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.